Hi, my name is David Wetton and welcome to the Now is the Time for Conscious Leadership podcast. The intent of this podcast is to encourage you as a leader to embrace conscious leadership by giving you access to some of the world's leaders in the, in the field of conscious leadership, both in practice and in thought. My heartfelt wish is that you leave this podcast feeling inspired with ideas to take away and implement in your business or organisation to make a real difference in our world. And my guest today is John Rennish, all the way from San Francisco. John has spent over half a century as a businessman and entrepreneur. He describes himself as an advisor, a mentor, a futurist and a writer on matters of social and organisational change. He believes that commerce holds the key to bringing about a global shift of human consciousness, thus creating a, a future of tremendous possibility for humankind. John states that the biggest crisis in the world today is actually the lack of really effective leadership, what he calls conscious leadership. And conscious leadership is a term John coined back in the 1980s to communicate the quality being called for in leading people, organizations and society through historic species-wide transformation and determining a positive future for our children and grandchildren to inherit, something that feels really needed for this moment in time. John was a founding member of the Conscious Leadership Guild set up in 2018 with the purpose to strengthen the competency and consciousness of its members in order to have more conscious leadership in place throughout the world. John was also inaugural board chair of the Shaping Tomorrow's Fortsight Network and co-founder of Future Shapers. Warren Bennis, the late international leadership expert, called John a wise elder who shines with wisdom. And indeed, through his wisdom, John has published 14 books to date, his latest being The Great Growing Up. And The Great Growing Up carries a subtitle, Being Responsible for Humanity's Future. And this seems so relevant now. And as you say in the book, John, we require a new level of maturity, taking responsibility for the whole, being accountable for our choices, individually and collectively. In a nutshell, we must grow up. And I first met you, John, in San Francisco a number of years ago, and it's a real privilege and honor to welcome you onto the show, John. Thank you for having me, David. So Take Five by the Dave Brubeck Quartet is my cue that it's time for you, John, to take five, your take on five conscious leadership questions. So the first question is, is perhaps a straightforward one, or maybe not so. John, what does conscious leadership mean to you? I'm glad you added the mean to me, because everybody in the field has a different definition of it, partially because consciousness is ineffable, and it's it begs to be defined, but I'll, I'll give it a try, even though I suggest that people don't try to define it. Um, conscious leadership is leadership with leadership by people who are really self-aware and have a very good understanding of who they are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are and come from that place of knowing themselves, um, including their intuition, their sense of source, of their source of inspiration, their source of guidance. Uh, and I hear a lot of that from the people that I consider conscious leaders, that they rely on that ineffable source of guidance. Um, call it God, call it source, call it providence, whatever they call it. So that allows them to see a wider range of th possibilities in their decisions and what they do. So it's a combination of being aware and responsible action with that awareness. In other words, rather than just being on the top of a mountain with light emanating from your skull, you are also aware of when you are aware you see things that need to be changed and you change them so that to me is a roundabout way of defining conscious leadership from my point of view mm. and i didn't take five minutes i know <laughs> <laughs> well thank thank you john and from what you're saying there i get a real sense that actually as you said it's not just about sitting on a mountain top it's actually about 
taking action for my sense it's about being and doing so the next question actually ties in quite nicely i know that in your book the great growing up you speak about how perhaps many leaders know how to do conscious leadership but they don't tend to do it because they're loyal to the existing system so this question is how do you john then how do you express conscious leadership through your own work um <clears throat> Well, since I mostly write, and I'm not leading an organization, well, I am leading an organization now with the Guild having started. Um, but in my writing, it's, it's taking a stand in my writing and being willing to be looking to look foolish. It's not a question of how I look, it's a question of what the result is. And so I, I feel very uh, courageous in my writing. Uh, in terms of leading an organization, which I almost forgot I did, because <laughs> uh, it's fairly new, uh, it's largely just holding the overview of what's going on. We have lots of members doing lots of things. And every once in a while, I have to kind of nudge, nudge somebody or nudge some, someone or nudge a team because it seems like they've gotten distracted by their daily work instead of the work on the guild. So uh, largely I'm a cheerleader and a um, big picture person in terms of how I, I don't even see, I don't, I'm having trouble even saying I lead the organization. I'm the founder. I'm one of the founding members. Um, I'm the president, which makes me the leader in title. So, but it's interesting that I haven't thought of myself as the leader mm. until you asked that question. It is interesting. And I'm curious as well, John, to know you say obviously a lot of your expression of conscious leadership is through your writing. So you must have come up against people who resist what you're writing, what you're saying when you're speaking about, I'm going to call it a new paradigm. How do you manage that? How do you overcome that? What's your message to others that may be out there writing on, on conscious leadership and looking to engage with others? What, what would you say to that? Well, I don't, I don't get many people to write me about my writings, disagreeing with it or calling it foolish. But when I was doing a lot of public speaking and traveling a lot more, which I haven't been doing for several years, I would get comments from the audience and you could tell what was behind their questions, um, which is doubting, doubting the efficacy of what I was talking about. Mm. Like it's impractical. Mm. We can never mm. do that in our company, you know, that mm. kind of thing. Um, but you don't know of, besides the two or three or four or five people that made a comment at, at one of the talks out of several hundred, what, what impact did you have on the several hundred? You don't know. And that's another part of being a conscious leader is you, you aren't looking for feedback. You aren't looking for stats. You have to just trust that what you're doing is the right thing to be doing. And you're having impact where impact is successful, where impact is willing to be, to be felt. And it's not, it's not always, it's sometimes resisted and sometimes some of it lets gets in and sometimes all of it gets in. And you don't need to know which those were, who, who was affected, who you influenced. You just have to be confident that what you're doing is the right thing to be doing for you, not what effect you're going to have on other people. I understand. So would that be, and I'm, I'm just thinking for listeners who are leaders listening to this podcast that, are, that perhaps resonate with your writing and want to put it into action, do you have an idea what would be one or two things that they could actually do? Because quite often I hear leaders say, well, I like the ideas, but I don't know how to implement them. Or are they fearful of interim? How do they get over that fear? That might be the question. How do you get over fear? Hmm. Um, <laughs> what I want to say is just do it. Just do it. <laughs> you know, just 
weigh, weigh whether or not it's the right thing to do, even if it's going to be unpopular, even if it might reflect negatively on you. And if you really feel it's the right thing to do, stand up for what's right. What's the right thing to do? Um, is that going to be soft and easy and gentle? And no, you know, when you when you're pushing against yourself, and we are our own worst enemies, um, we have a lot of reasonability built up around why we shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. We have to overcome that and recognize that, maybe even analyze that to some degree. But when you see something that should be done, the right thing to do, do it. So it is really, I think, for, for me, for hearing you talking there, you mentioned, I think, in the, early on about awareness. So I think it's maybe that awareness that the leader has that, as you said, this is the right thing to do and I'm going to take a stand with this. There was a, a years ago, there was a, a conference in Manhattan called the Spirituality in Business. It was a great event. In fact, we, Judy, Neil, and I launched the uh, Spirit at Work Awards there. Um, they never really had another event like that in the United States. It was a great event. But I remember riding up the elevator <clears throat> and there was another conference going on alongside of us, which was the oil and gas people. Mm -hmm. And this guy was riding up with me and I said, so what's your, what do you do? Um, he said, I'm, I rape the planet. That's the terms he used. I raped the planet. Um, and I came away from thinking, how would I be, how would I live if I thought of myself as a rapist of the planet? Um, and I'm sure he meant it kind of tongue in cheek uh, because I had my spirituality and business badge on, you know, so he's probably saying that for my benefit. But nonetheless, some part of him saw himself as a pillager of the planet. And um, it just, it just, I had so much compassion for anybody that's doing work that they are committed to and that it earns the, you know, earns them a living and supports their family and gets their kids to tuition to, for school and all that. But at the same time, they have this little voice in the back of their head that this isn't really good for humanity. Mm -hmm. And that must be a hell of a tension. It's totally, uh, it yeah. could be turned into creative tension if they have the willingness to do that. Mm, thank you. That's a wonderful point that they might well reach that point of created, uh, you know, tension and decide to take a step, which actually leads me nicely into the next question. I know on your website, some of the articles, you, you speak about uh, some of the people who you think, ex you know, are exemplars of conscious leadership. So the next question actually is around that, that, that route. Who for you, John, is an exemplar of conscious leadership and why? It could be dead, it could be alive. Um, I did a series of articles um, a couple of years ago where I profiled, I had short profiles of people that I thought were conscious leaders. The plan was ultimately that we put a yearbook together and every year I'd publish a, a collection of conscious leader profiles. That never happened. But there were, I think about 80 people or 90 people I profiled in that series of articles. Um, ones that aren't with us anymore, I remember being, one being the king of Bhutan who initiated the gross national happiness. Uh, yes, yes. Um, uh, Nelson Mandela, of course, and, and Desmond Tutu are clearly in that category. Mm. But of, of living people, um, I would include Bill George, who used to be CEO of Medtronic, is now at Harvard doing teaching. Uh, and a man that is tends to be very shy, but I consider him, I know him probably better than any of them. His name is Steve Pirsanti. He's the publish, the founder of Barrett Kohler Publishing, which is to me the most progressive book publisher in the world, especially when it comes to business and spirit. 
and I've known Steve, shared a room with him at the book convention. Um, no, no, I've known him since before he started Barrett Kohler. And he is, he, he, I asked him if I could profile him. And he said, well, why don't you profile the company? Because that's the way he thinks. Mm -hmm. And I ended up profiling him without his permission. I didn't need his permission to profile him. But he is definitely a, a man of ex, ex, an exemplar of a conscious leader for me. And, and, what, right. what, and so what sort of qualities then, John, do you see in him that makes him an exemplar of conscious leadership? He's incredibly democratic. And even though he was and still is the acquisition editor, he was wearing three hats until uh, a year ago or so. He was, he was the CEO, he's the president, and he was also the chief acquisitions officer. So he's kept the chief acquisitions officer and he's given away the other two jobs to other people. So even though he's the chief acquisition officer and the founder of the company, you'd think that if you are on the good side of him and liked, and he liked you, that he'd say yes to the book submission. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, I, we have a team and they all have to agree that this is a book we should take on. Not, I, I can't do it on my own. So he's got that sense of democratic participation by other people in the company. He's also made a move to uh, but the, it's, it's a B Corp, Barrett Kohler is a B Corp, but he's also set it up that it's in, being held in trust, and I don't remember the name of the trust or the name of the legal uh, application, but it's a trust that goes on forever. So it doesn't, if he dies owning a lot of stock, it doesn't, his stock is in that trust as well. So it perpetu it's perpetually owned by people that care about the world. Mm. And that's a very bold move. It is a bold move, isn't it? A real sort uh, of commitment to a legacy then. Yeah. And he's not doing it for a legacy. He's just doing it because it feels like the right thing to do. Right. And it goes against convention of leaving your stock to somebody else and they may or may not have the same values you do. That's wonderful. And, and I wanted to ask as well, um, the sort of second part to this, for, for those that are, that are watching, that are listening this, to this, this podcast, what, um, you mentioned B Corp, but what, what resources, there could be books or whatever, what resources have you found helpful whilst you've been exploring the, the field of conscious leadership? What do oh you think? my God. <laughs> that, that, you're asking me to go back 50 years and look at all the influences mm. I've had. Well, Willis Harmon was probably my biggest influence. He became a dear friend and an un, I don't know if I say unwilling, but he, he weren't, we weren't specifically uh, explicitly a mentor mentee, but he was mm. definitely a mentor for me. Um, he was, when he died, he was head of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. I don't know if you're familiar with that organization over there in UK land. No, I'm not, no, that's... But Willis Harmon, and then there was a, a, the two people that I met that kind of got me into the work I'm doing now, because I was writing independently before that, and the other one was Peter Senge at MIT. Oh, yes. yes, yeah. And through Peter, I learned about systems thinking, and I, I have become a student, a scholar of systems thinking ever since I met Peter in 80, I guess, something like that. And with Willis, I learned that, oh, there's something you can do to help the world. <laughs> I was just a business guy, a small business guy, and I was just out to have fun and make a little money in the, pro in the process. So those two people had a huge influence on me. You quoted uh, Warren Bennis. Um, Warren was a, um, well, he was obviously a global expert on leadership. And that's what he wrote about and all that. But he, none of his leadership books talked about the spiritual side specifically. Mm -hmm. 
And yet he was very interested, like in the newsletter I published. In fact, Charles Handy came to visit him uh, one time. They were good friends, and he came to visit him in Southern California. And, and he said that Warren rushed and got me the copy of The New Leaders and wanted me to be sure to know that that was being published up in San Francisco. And mm-hmm. he ended up coming up to San Francisco to meet with me after that. And he told me that story. Wonderful. So there was both with Charles and with Warren, I think, and they were a different generation. Um, I think there was an appreciation for this kind of talk or writing, but they didn't specifically write much about it themselves. It was kind of like their inspiration, but not their, they made their living writing about leadership. In fact, the last book that I'm aware of that, that um, Charles wrote, and, and Charles is still around. He's still kicking over there. Um, I think it was The Hungry Spirit. Oh, right. yes. It started yes. getting into the spiritual stuff. Yes. yes. Which is great news. It is. But people with that kind of profile start talking about this stuff. People tend to listen. People that wouldn't listen to me necessarily <laughs> tend to listen to him. And that's, that's a great segue into the next question, actually, John. But Bill, really to close this last question, because I, I heard you say that, it's my own sense that actually, in, in, you know, for leaders that are looking to step into conscious leadership and really address it, it does feel as though it's helpful to have a mentor who's there, someone who can help support and guide this journey through, you know, and into conscious leadership, which is an ongoing journey, I believe, in my view. And you mentioned the spiritual, which is why I said it's a segue, because research, and you yourself will know Professor Jody Fry at Texas A&M University, his research suggests that... Uh, an inner life is the source of conscious leadership, where inner life is a form of spiritual or contemplative practice, including walking in nature, meditation, etc. I remember actually when I came out to San Francisco, you were the one that guided me to go and walk the labyrinth at Grace uh-huh. Cathedral. Yeah, so right. my question to you is, is in, this, in conscious leadership, what practices, what spiritual practices have you found helpful for yourself to ground your work? Um, all of the above. (laughs) Um, I, I'd say that meditation is taking a bigger chunk of my life these days than it, than it was when you were here. Um, I'm part of a meditation group with Peter Russell, who's one of your countrymen. Um, he lives right here in the Bay area. Um, the guild, every time we have a guild meeting, we always start with a little silence and a short meditation. Um, whenever I'm in any group setting, I try to create what I call sacred space. Mm-hmm. When Future Shapers was being more active, the company that I'm a part owner and founder of, we uh, would start every meeting with a reading of creating sacred space. So it was about four paragraphs just to get people in the mood so they know they're not sitting on on the train or on the bus coming to work. They're actually in a different kind of meeting. Yes. So it's it's become more since since you were here, I I'd say it's become more explicit for me. And I don't have any bashfulness about it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I'm on a bus or sitting in a waiting room uh, for my doctor, I'll just close my eyes and meditate. And I don't care whether people think I'm asleep or not, you know, I just do it. Uh, It's a great way to spend that that time that's otherwise, quote, wasted, unquote, um, doing something very positive. Mm-hmm. And to me, something that's, I think, most people think that it has to be quiet to be to do meditation. I take a different tack, as does Peter, my teacher, is that the more noise you have, the more challenge you have. It's kind of like putting on extra weights in the gym, you know? Mm-hmm. 
the first time I, I recognized that is I meditated from New, New York to California on an airplane. Might have been the last plane trip I took, which is like five, six years ago. Because uh, I've retired from flying. I've decided I, I, I don't want to do that anymore. So we'll see how that holds up in terms of people wanting me to be a, a, a further than a car ride away sometimes. But um, I ended up meditating the whole way with the engines running and people talking mm -hmm. and all the stuff that goes on in an airplane. And the surprise part about it was the plane seemed, rather than being a five and a half hour trip, it seemed like a two hour trip. Mm -hmm. So time passed very quickly because I wasn't in the distraction of flight attendants doing things and other passengers doing things. I didn't have any visual. I had my eyes closed the whole time. And I'm sure they thought I was sleeping, which is fine. <laughs> well, well th thank you, John, for really, I think, giving a great example of sharing how you, I'm going to say embody it, you know, in your day-to-day -day life as, as you move around. Because a phrase I hear quite often is, you know, if it's meditation, that, that sometimes the real meditation begins when you get off the mat in a sense that you take it out into the world. And my sense is that conscious leaders actually embody it out in the world. So I love that you're talking about taking spare moments to meditate, but actually when you're having meetings, you're bringing it, you're bringing a sense of that awareness, that spirituality into the meeting, whether it's a reading, whether it's a moment of, of silence. And, and finally, I'm just, I just remember, because you prompted me, Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Zen master, has written a beautiful book called Work, in there, he talks about how we can use certain events in our workplace to act as almost like a bell of mindfulness, to bring us back to ourselves, to bring us into the meeting, to bring us present to what's going on. And, and I hear a lot of talk about conscious leaders, how they can bring their presence into, into the meeting. So, so thank you for that. Um, my next question is actually, it's a, it's a, it is given unlimited time and resources <laughs> What single thing would you recommend aspiring conscious leaders to do? Get to know themselves. Uh, embrace who they are, <clears throat> the shadow and the light. Um, the more you get to know yourself, the more you're willing to be guided by something bigger than yourself. I think the closer you're getting to that place where you can make decisions and make choices that are more, more for the benefit of all rather than the benefit of we or me. Uh, a lot of leaders as you probably know, um, spent a fair amount of their energies advancing their careers. And what they're paid to do is advance their company's agenda. But the, a lot, there's a lot of new leaders, uh, new conscious leaders coming into play now that are not only looking at what's good for them or what's good for their company, but what's good for the planet. Mm what's good for all. And I, what I'm fond of saying for the last few years is that people's asked me when the, when the paradigm is going to change. And I remember Michael Ray from Stanford business school and I talking in 88 about the new paradigm and how imminent it was, you know, it was like right around the corner. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's now 32 years later and it's still not here. But so when I, I am asked that question, I say, when, when the, when the well-being of all of us takes precedent over the well-being of any one of us or any one group of us, that's when I think the tipping point will occur. That's when we'll start making decisions that benefit everybody rather than just benefiting some. Thank you, John. That's, those are really beautiful words. Thank you. I, I do appreciate you, you sharing those. And, and, and really, finally, I come to what I call my Columbo, just one more thing question. 
I love Columbo, and he always used to ask an important question at the end, just as he was leaving. Yeah, I remember Columbo, yeah. <laughs> yes. So my question really is, is to give the guests on this podcast a chance to, to share um, what you might to share of your own work and your own offerings, perhaps your own events, your own books. Just please, you know, just share for those you think that are watching and listening, what might be of use to them, which you have to offer. Well, I've been very prolific over the last 40 years. So I've got tons of articles that I've written for other people, tons of articles in my newsletters, which have, the newsletter celebrated its 20th anniversary last year. No, two years ago. Um, so if you go to my website, and I'm not looking for business, so I'm not <laughs> saying this is a commercial plug, but my website is loaded with articles, newsletter articles, uh, blogs, uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand pieces that, that might, might be something that people could get value, I think they'd get value from. <clears throat> Another source would be go to the Amazon and besides the books, there are several documents. Uh, what do they call them in the old days? E-docs, I guess. Yeah. So there's one on conscious leadership. There's one on building a conscious organization, which are just five and six pages long. And they're, I think they can buy them for like two or three dollars, something like that. So the book, obviously the books are part of that. There's 14 books out there. Um, so the books plus the e-docs on Amazon and my website okay, posting. Thanks. And then your website, John, is it right? It's Renish.com. Renish.com. R-E-N-E-S-C-H.com. Okay. Thank you for that, John. And I will also, I'll, I'll put links below so people can Great. access it through, through a link. And I just wanted, and I will say a final thank you in a second, but I just wanted to close actually with the ending piece from your last book, The Great Growing Up, because I really love this quote where you say, let us take history by the throat and create a future for all the world that is more befitting, civil and self-respecting for mature human beings. Let us not only dare to know as Kant challenged us more than two centuries ago, but let us also dare to dream the great dream and create a world that allows us to live and work together with the freedom to pursue aliveness, greatness, success, and true happiness. I wrote that. You wrote that, John. Thank you for writing that. That has inspired me during, you know, within this podcast. And I, from my own experience, I would just urge readers, you know, the, the book, sorry, listeners, The Great Growing Up it is, has been a book which... Uh, I found tremendously helpful. So thank you for writing that, John. You're most welcome. And I want to say, John, thank you so much for being on the show and for showing up in the world of conscious leadership in the way that you do. My pleasure. And I want to thank all the listeners to this podcast. If you're willing, please do share a link to this podcast with those you think would truly benefit from it. I do truly believe that now is the time for conscious leadership. And with all the inspiring heartfelt work you do as listeners, I have no doubt that conscious leadership will become a thriving reality, making a difference for the greater good of all. So until next time, I'll leave you with a blessing from John O'Donoghue. May the light of your soul bless the work you do with the secret love and warmth of your heart. And so it is. <laughs>